the meeting. It is now streaming. We are live on Facebook, according to the Zoom broadcast. Now streaming. We are live on Facebook. So yeah, turn the vol- you gotta turn the volume down. If you're if you're like on the Zoom call and you have the Facebook, then like and- you're just gonna hear us talking delayed. Yeah. It's good to be back. It's been a few weeks since we've done a Facebook Live, so we're back uh, broadcasting to the world. Um, So folks, if you're hopping on, give us a like. Actually, hit the wow face because that is the way to go. So go down to the like button, hover over it until you see the little wow icon and hit that because it helps us get this on more people's news feeds. Um, But while we're here, I'm going to go ahead and share this on my personal page. But we're we're talking about race car prep, track car prep, how to make sure that um, you got your car prepared to go on the racetrack. Maybe it's your first event, or maybe you're in the off-season doing some preparations in the shop. We're going to be talking with Mitch Cobb, who's right there, about Hello, world. how he does to prepare customer race cars. So what's going on, Mitch? What, what, uh, what's going on in your world right now? I see there's obviously a Porsche Cayman behind you. Yeah, I've got too much going on. Um, so January 15th. Correct. There's a uh, an event at Barber. Yep. That be at. You got some. You're doing some coaching there. That's and the plan. Came in. Came in behind me is going to be there, uh, doing a bunch of steering upgrades on it. We've got another customer's E46 M3 WRL car. That uh, first first race that it did last year got into the tire wall, and then we just kind of said. Oh, well, it's a race car and just now took it to the body shop. So we're just getting back from the body shop tomorrow. And then I have basically a full off season worth of upgrades and maintenance and redos and everything else to do in the next two weeks. So, yeah, just two weeks to get it all done. So it's not a big deal. That's the the life of the racer, though, right? It's It's all contingent around the next Mm -hmm. event. Who's this little guy behind you? Can you see him? Yeah. That's Wyatt. Hey, Wyatt. What's up, buddy? Cool. We got a lot of the usual suspects on the broadcast already. Jim Smithling, who just bought a uh, a Honda Fit. Um, Is is Jim, Jim, are you going uh, Sunday Cup racing? Sunday Cup. Sunday Cup's plan. Chris Tanfaro's on. Ryan Finch is asking, uh, that's not an E46 behind you. What is going on? Like, that's weird because like the E46 whisper. Um, more, normally I'm I'm a BMW guy, but you got to branch out every now and then. That's right. You got to get outside of your comfort zone. Uh, all right, guys. So you know who I am. I'm Andrew Rains with Apex Pro. We are here tonight to talk to my good friend, Mr. Mitch Cobb, recently married man, working on race cars, dirty hands to prove it. And uh, yeah. Mitch is going to tell us, we're going to, we're going to learn a little bit about who Mitch is, Mitch is, because he has a super cool background. And for those of you that follow us on Facebook and Instagram, you've probably seen Mitch's picture. You've seen me talk about him because he and I've worked together for what, four or five races now. And have pretty uh, much either uh, one least, or yeah. almost won most of them, except for GLTC at NCM, every other race we were in contention for the win. Yeah. Um, so it's been a, been a pretty cool run. And before too long, we will be, co-owners in a motorsport shop business, a racing car preparation shop, auto mechanic shop, whatever you want to call it. But we're going to be working on your track cars to take them to the racetrack. Um, I'm obviously still, Apex Pro is still my job, but um, there's another part of my life where I own this business called Alabama Gearheads and we store cars and we're going to have a full-time in-house race prep shop where we're going to be able to take your track car or your race car here in Birmingham, Alabama and prepare it to go on the racetrack. So super excited to get that in the works. So that's kind of what you're hinting at when you're saying you've got a busy couple of weeks yeah. here. Yeah. On top of keeping everybody happy that we're already, you know, helping out most of these guys that you put me in touch with all of these guys that you put me in touch with. Um, yeah. Just quick little build a business and uh, launch that while we're at it. Right. Not a big deal. Yeah. And we're going drifting. We're going drifting. So don't forget that. That's important. Never been drifting. Here we go. Yeah. 
gonna do some yeah. gonna do some some drifty boys. So guys, as you're watching, ask us uh, your questions as it relates to track car prep. Let us know what winter projects you're undertaking. So if you're right, there's 14 people on here right now. If you're watching, let us know in the comments what are you doing on your car this winter to prepare it for next season. So are you ordering some new wheels and tires? Hey Ryan Burkert, what's up, man? Um, let us know what types of projects you have undergoing on your race car or track car or hell even your whatever i put i put my nudge guard my like brush guard back on my disco this weekend so i'll, I'll get it started that's, that's my project but um let's learn a little bit about mitch so mitch you started racing in carts so you're you're pretty much a lifelong racer like and we got to know each other because you work at the barber uh vintage motorsports museum so let's let's talk about the early days and then how you got to restoring you know hundred year old motorcycles and formula one cars. But, uh, how did the, how did the karting thing start? So karting started in like, Oh, one, 2001, uh, I lived in Colorado at the time. And me and my dad went to Vandermeer, the drag strip out there, like big NHRA drag strip. They were doing like a testing tune or, you know, who knows, who knows what it was, but there's a, a cart track in the parking lot there. And so, like, the whole time we were out there looking at the drag cars, my dad's, you know, he's been a, a muscle car guy, hard ride guy forever. Um, I was I was over here checking out the go-karts, and we went down there, and one thing led to another, and I guess it was that year, maybe the next year, uh, probably a year later, so probably, like, 2002, so I would have been 11, 12 years old, uh, got my first go-kart, and kind of blew up from there, you know, went from something me and my dad would do every couple of weeks, just go kill a Saturday to this is my life now. <laughs> and and you went, so you got pretty serious in karting too. Like it wasn't like, like you're saying. Yeah, no, it, it, yeah. Life. It wasn't just like, you know, yard carts and, and bumper cars. Um, won two state championships in Colorado. Uh, did national level karting, stars of karting, which was kind of the, the go-to series for probably like early 2000s um raced with them shifter carts uh ica direct drive carts for three years i guess uh never won any of those championships but did pretty well um went out to scusa super nationals which is still kind of the premier uh national level go-kart race went and did, there, did that a couple times and kind of kept kept moving and grooving from there um and did a little bit of Formula BMW stuff back when that was a thing. Yeah, so was with... tested a Formula BMW car, right? That was yeah, kind of that, a so formula at the time. It was kind of funny. Yeah, I mean, my uncle who lived in Guntersville, Alabama, ended up becoming friends with a guy that owned the Formula BMW team, which who would ever thought that Formula BMW would be in Guntersville, Alabama, but it was. Yeah. Um, so he put us in touch and got hooked up with those guys and drove those cars for a while. And right is that was starting to take off. I mean, I went to, went to Spain, went to Valencia, did their licensing course, went back for their, they do like a, they did like a scholarship shootout thing where like the top however many drivers um, every year from their just licensing course would get invited back for a scholarship deal. Uh, I think they'd give out three or four of those a year. So didn't get that, but Got to go back, so that was cool. Got to drive at Valencia a couple times. Um, but right as all that was going on, it just so happened that when we were still living in Colorado, Bill Elliott, like Bill from Dawsonville, uh, he had retired, and he had moved out to Colorado as well, and we got to know him, and he's like, no, that's not what you need to be doing. Here's what you need to be doing. Uh, <laughs> let me, let me so show you kind of, yeah, let, let me show you something. And when someone like that, you know, they offer their help, you uh, you tend to listen. Um, so raised dirt cars for a while, dirt late models. So like turn right to go left kind of stuff, you know, staggered special and that's perfect. Um, did that for a little while, raced, then went to asphalt late models. Uh, did that for like three or four years. And that's kind of what ended up taking me to the Barber Museum here in Birmingham. Uh, where I've been for like 11 and a half years almost. Uh, so gotten to work on Ferraris and you know, all sorts of Formula One cars and Can-Am cars and Lotus, you know, factory race cars and Formula One cars and all sorts of stuff. A lot yeah. of motorcycles. Motorcycles. Your casual um, backyard shade tree mechanic type stuff. 
there at yeah. the Barber yeah. Vintage Motorsports Museum. Yeah. Really VHVs, shoddy facilities. 15,000 RPM V8s and, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, <clears throat> folks, you really don't want somebody that's worked on Cosworth DFVs and Lotus factory race cars working on your track car. They obviously don't know anything about it if they're coming from that background. Um, that's obviously a joke, but you, so you, I asked you to send me like your, your resume. So I was reading through it. Cause I've already, you've, you know, kind of like shared your story with me because we've known each other for a little while and talked about racing and backgrounds and stuff. And, but I think your references are pretty interesting because your first reference is Bill and Cindy Elliott, you know, <laughs> you and that's, gotta go. <laughs> yeah, that's just really cool because we've had that conversation before about how you knew Chase Elliot when he was younger and y'all were kind yeah. of friends they grew up together kind of in the same area in Colorado but it's just it's pretty cool to see you know I always assumed Bill Elliot was a really cool guy and he's obviously kind of getting back in doing some vintage cars and road yeah, racing stuff which is cool but um, I guess when you're like an up-and-coming racer you know you're a kid and you're like gonna go do this formula car stuff and then Bill Elliot comes in and he's like no son let me show you a stock car I guess you're just like yes sir thank you sir okay yeah, I mean, it's it's like, no question, you know, he says, I know some guys, they'll show you how to drive a dirt car, you'll learn how to drive a dirt car, and then, like, he, I mean, he had this whole plan laid out, you'll drive a dirt car, and then we'll do the asphalt stuff for a little while, and then we'll put you in an ARCA car for a couple of years, and then you'll go to, uh, I guess it was Craftsman trucks back then, and, you know, off you go, and that all happened to, like, directly coincide with you know, 2008 financial, whatnot, um, housing, you know, everything, everyone knows what happened. Um, yeah. so that's, that was when came back to Alabama and, and started working at museum. So it was, you know, not everything we hoped and dreamed it would be at that point in time, but ended up at, at Barber, which certainly is nothing to, to be upset about. Yeah. Um, you probably have yeah. a job that like literally thousands and thousands of people around the country, Oh yeah, that are obviously watching this right now are thinking, "Wow, I could be restoring Formula One cars," um, which is is legitimately what you're doing is working on. And and not even that, you know, you mentioned you said you know driving KM cars, but you've also driven a car up the the hill at Goodwood. It's probably a story worth telling. There's a couple of other kind of road racing related things to unpack in your in your bio, but tell us about driving the uh, was it 1964 Ferrari Formula One so, car. Yeah. Four cars at Goodwood, um, which if if you guys that are watching, uh, if you don't know what Goodwood is, look it up real quick. They've got awesome social media presence. They've got awesome YouTube stuff. Um, it's basically any and every absolutely awesome car or motorcycle, or they have airplanes there because of course they do. Um, it's it's a hill climb where they just it's it's an exhibition. They have uh, timed events. You know they you can compete. But it's all just, it's an exhibition. It's a show. It's all for fun. Um, I've gotten to go three times, I believe, with the museum. Uh, twice, I was, I was kind of responsible for and driving the, our 1964 Ferrari 158, which is the car that John Surtees won his Formula One championship in. And if you're not familiar with John Surtees, also look him up. Super cool guy. Um, only person to have ever won... Formula One World Championships and Motorcycle Grand Prix World Championships, won seven Motorcycle World Championships. Um, so I got to drive that up. And it's, you know, th this car, it's like the early 60s torpedo. Uh, yeah, cigar, cigar body, zero, yeah. absolutely zero aerodynamic yeah. appendages. It, it drives like an absolute go-kart. You know, the, the steering is just, you you do this and it, it takes off, uh, you know. 12 or 14,000 RPM, one and a half liter dual overhead cam, 90 degree V8. It only makes like 200 horsepower, but, but the sound it makes is, is worth 10,000 horsepower. Yeah. Um, and so, and, and, and they always do the run groups at Goodwood kind of based on particular types of cars or particular eras. So like one year we went and it was the 70th anniversary of Ferrari in, in motorsport. And so it was all the Ferraris. So it's me, and I was I was probably 25 at the time. You know, this this incredible experience. And I'm over here next to all these, you know, 250 GTOs and 250 LMs and this Formula One car and that Formula One car. 
oh, there's Kimi Raikkonen in his 07 car. Oh, there's uh, Derek Bell driving this car. You know, it's it's it, it's unreal. Um, yeah. A couple of years later, we went back and I got to drive. We have at the museum uh, uh, 1969, I believe. Uh, Dan Gurney, Lotus, uh, 60, shoot, no, I don't remember. Dan Gurney, Lotus, IndyCar. So it's it's a 289 Ford uh, IndyCar engine with four, you know, dual barrel Weber, Weber carburetors on it, about that big around. They're, they're uh, 58 millimeter Weber carburetors. And so it's like the most extreme two-stroke dirt bike you've ever driven. You know, from zero to wide open or nothing. Six thousand RPM, nothing. And yeah. and again, this is an exhibition. You know, you've got cold tires. The the surface is dirty from people going off and doing donuts and stuff. And this thing yeah. goes from nothing to absolute wide open, like that. And so it it, it gets kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, oh, it's, I can it, only imagine. The hell of an experience. So yeah. I've watched, I've watched, because recently they've started, uh, you know, live streaming the festival speed on, on YouTube um, and seeing, you know, some of the stuff that they take up the hill, you're kind of like that, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's almost more suited to a street car, like the high performance street cars that they take up the oh, hill well, makes perfect sense for the race cars. You're like, they got cold tires, they're on slicks. They only have, you know, what a mile and a half to get everything warm. Like it's gotta be terrifyingly sketchy in some of those cars, especially like you and the you know formula one cars well and, and like i'm i'm going slow enough that it's not like too sketchy it's still less than you know as comfortable as being out at, at barber and as far as like runoff there's usually a little runoff but then it's hay bales if you happen to go off track it's it's not good i mean a couple cars get completely thrashed yeah. everywhere yeah. Uh, so before we hop in and, and look at some more questions, uh, I got a couple of things I want to ask people about after they uh, made some comments. But how much seat time in the car did you get before you went to Goodwood? Did you like do as many laps as you wanted at Barber? Or? Oh, it, uh, funny story. Uh, the first time we went to Goodwood in the Ferrari, I had never driven that car, and like you know, the cars get shipped over on on a ship. So you know, a month or two, whatever it was, before the event. We had pulled the car off display, you know, prepped it, made sure everything was good. Uh, those cars, we keep them in, you know, 90% running order, but it still takes a couple hours of work, a couple of days of work. I don't know what it is to get it going. So we pulled it down, got it ready, you know, do all the same basic prep that we all should do. Um, and then they're like, all right, go, you know, go, go get used to it. Go, go take it for a spin, give it a couple of laps. And I'm like, um, I've never actually driven the track this was eight years ago probably like 2014 like i've i've never uh been on track i'm like what what you know they just kind of assumed that yeah you know whatever you work here like, he's so, driven the racetrack okay. or i take this priceless formula one car out can i take like something else and i had a i had a wrx subaru wrx at the time they're like uh, yeah sure just go take a couple laps so first laps ever on the track were you know, my, my daily driver car just, you know, farting around did 10 or 12 laps, whatever, to kind of learn it a little bit better. And then second time I ever went on track was in a world championship winning formula one car. Totally so. completely priceless car. Yeah. 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 That's nuts. That's uh that's totally crazy. I, I think it's like being able to, um, to work at a place that maintains stuff like, you know, the culture that they have there of maintaining all of these cars to and motorcycles to essentially running condition. And like the, for the people watching that haven't been to the Barber Museum, it doesn't quite carry the same like panache if you haven't been there. But for those of you that have right now, you're like watching this, like, wow, because it's probably the coolest museum, one of the coolest museums on the planet. Uh, and one of those places that just really makes you like, I don't know, it, it, it's, it's just, a significant place it's totally wild um, so it's it's cool that you've gotten to have those experiences and and gotten your hands on some truly unique i think it's it's really made you such a versatile mechanic because like when we've been racing yeah. together and you've been presented with some of these you know car prep challenges or modification challenges your mindset is never like just get 
done what needs to be done, you know, just like, just get the car ready to go. It's always like, okay, that's a, that's a given for you. It's like, I'm going to do everything possible to make it the car reliable and run good. But like, what are we going to do to win? Like, what are we going to do to race the car? Like what modifications, how can we push the rules? You know, like the questions that you've been asking me ever since we've been racing together, it's always like, dude's a racer. You know, like I knew that, like when we first met, it's like, it's a mentality, it's an attitude, it's a mindset, you know, and it's just like switched on. But I think, although you didn't really get to like race per se during your time at Barber, but it's still the like level of expectation and quality is like, we did do two years in lemons. (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Some lemons, some lemons racing. (laughs) Yeah. Um, we got some good some good projects. One of the coolest things, like I think that I've gained from the museum is every single, I mean, we do have the, you know, the, the cars that we regularly run or, or whatever from the collection, but every single restoration project I've done, you have to become, you know, an expert on that particular piece and you spend six, eight, 10 months restoring it and then it's done and it goes on display. And like one of the first major restorations I did was a 1938 BMW motorcycle, which if you ever want to take on a pre-war German project, don't. Um, (laughs) Finding parts, not so easy. But so, I mean, I knew everything there was to know about 1938 BMW. And now I've never worked on one again. So so you have to really kind of be able to, to adapt and figure out how you have to figure out how to figure out stuff um and and you learn a lot of uh you know we're we're, especially certain manufacturers have bmw they kind of do stuff the same course they kind of do stuff the same and and you can apply that even if i'm i'm working on the power steering on the skateman i've never done a power steering pump on a 2006 Cayman before but it's pretty similar to other course stuff super similar to other Cayman stuff and so you can take that knowledge and, and kind of carry it over to everything. That you do. Yeah. Well, and the skill set to re-engineer, you know, and I say re-engineer because if you're working on a pre-war German artifact, obviously most of that country was destroyed during World War II. So you probably are having to like re-engineer in your brain. Like, how did they put this thing together? Why did they make these decisions? I don't have these pieces that are going to fit, you know, parts just don't there's no way it's not only like, is there a lack of availability? It's like, you probably are like trying to find like one guy in Bavaria who knows how the thing that, goes together. Yeah. And that, that's usually how, for those specific projects, how it goes is you do end up finding the guy. Um, yeah. And, and, and you have to really lean on them, which is, is no different than, than in motorsport or track days or whatever. You kind of find your, your local or regional um, guy that that you know you can lean on whether it's whether it's for for maintenance whether it's for modifications whether it's for driver coaching you know whatever it may be you get hooked up you you find the right people and you you know that they can steer you in the right direction yeah absolutely let's let's revisit some of the projects that people are talking about uh, in the comments so ryan burker okay, you're AI. doing a lot better than i am keeping up with this <laughs> i told you it was hard we were prepping for this like it's hard to keep up with the comments on facebook because it it's like not intuitive when you're on the Zoom call. Ryan is rebuilding a 1.6 Miata engine, uh, double checking all the bolts, hoping to get a simple string alignment contraption set up so he can e- easily set up and tear down. So he wants to have like a nice string set up so he can align the car. Um, Ryan runs a, a NA Miata in uh, NASA time trials. Cool. Our buddy uh, Ryan, Ryan Finch is just changing pads, changing brake pads. Big old project off season. Can you handle it, Ryan? Um, so Miata, that we were talking about drifting earlier. I have a absolutely 100% bone stock in the Miata 99 that when I first got stuck home during quarantine, like ripped everything out of it. So it weighs like 1800 pounds, but that's all that's been done to it. And that's going to be our, uh, drift mule. Yeah. So if, if you have any, uh, I can help you with the string alignment. If you can help us with. Miata drifty boy pointers. Yeah, so we we need to turn a bare bones NB Miata into a top notch drift car in seventy two hours or less. For free, preferably. Preferably, yes. 
uh, Jim Smithling's going to Koenig Wheels, Falcon RT660s, G Lock R8s. Yes, sir. Good stuff. Hybrid Racing Shifter and uh, FA10s for his Sunday Cup Honda Fit. Man, I thought that was all going to be for the S2000. I was like, yeah, that's a, good, that's a healthy season, but that's even better on the Fit. I think everyone eventually is going to realize that Sunday Cup is probably better than GM. You, you've driven the Sunday Cup race, haven't you? Uh, no, I haven't, I haven't competed, but I've driven some Sunday Cup cars. Yeah, it's it's fun. It's it's really stupid fun. Um, that, Justin uh, Okamoto says hi. We talked with him last week about some E36-related questions. Did you uh, figure out the M M42? Am I remembering right? Yeah, Justin, yeah. did you decide to go uh, big boost or, uh, or or relatively small boost or or upgrade to the six cylinder? And then Jim Smithling said, doesn't uh, doesn't awesome Bill still have the speed record at NASCAR uh, for a NASCAR close course speed record? Pretty sure it's at Talladega. Yeah, qualifying session. Well, whatever. Yeah, he said that. So twelve eight oh nine. That car. So back in the good old days when NASCAR used like individual templates, that car is like six inches narrower than it should have been, but still fit all the templates. Pretty cool stuff. And that going back to what you're talking about, pushing the rules, there's nothing in the rules that said it had to be this wide. It just had to meet these templates and how they made it work. I don't know, but it's still, it's still 100% legal. So it NASCAR just, said you have to fit within the template, but they didn't say you, you couldn't be smaller than the template. They, they would use like 2d cutout body templates. So like you have the profile, of you know you go up the hood up the windshield back down the car and they put a template over that to make sure uh right. you know okay yeah this is the thunderbird template it, it works and they would you know they'd have one for the overall from front to back they'd have one side to side they'd have one for this fender that fender. you know they probably have a dozen different templates if not more and as long as each template fit individually you're good they just, this was before. Now they have one big, now right. it's, they have one that just sits on the top of the car. And yeah. everything has to be where it's supposed to be, not just individually, but in relation to everything. But before uh, this piece had to be fit this template, also in relation to this template, you're able to get away with that kind of stuff. And that's, yeah, that's, that's the cool. stuff. Finding that's the, cool. Finding the right piece. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that lap was like 211 miles an hour or something, average speed you somewhere had, in that neighborhood. You said, someone said, yeah, 212.809. Yeah, that's freaking wild. Yeah, and that's, in, a, in a full body stock car. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Not, not, a, not an open wheel car. Um, Ryan Finch says John drove a Honda V12 Formula One car. Who's John? He did. John Serkis. Ah. He he drove it and uh, subsequently ended up having an off-track excursion. I'll I'll leave it at that to not 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 be too uh, <laughs> encouraging. Yeah. Um, Ryan Burkert says those are awesome stories. Yeah, they're pretty cool. Uh, just imagine what you would have missed out on if you just drove stock cars in circles, winky face. If uh, I I will say if around. You, ever get the chance to drive a dirt car of any sort do it they're fun they're so fun different whole completely different world uh racing techniques mindset than like road course stuff but super cool super fun yeah we've talked about dirt track stuff and they just opened a new dirt track south of us i think we might have to uh as part of our um, due diligence on the local motorsports industry, we might have to put together a car and go down there and play around at some point. Just, you know, learn the crowd. Um, Ryan's asking some garage alignment questions. Uh, are there preferred ways to get a good alignment if you have a sloped floor or sloped floors? Um, uh, so start. with the string alignments, it doesn't matter. The, the you, you put the strings in relation to the car. I mean, you, you want it, as level as possible so the weight and the suspension isn't completely loaded or, or misloaded one way or the other but since the strings are attached to the car if if it's off a little bit it, it's not doesn't, doesn't really affect it that's being level is much more important if you're trying to corner balance on the scales um, which i mean yeah in a perfect world everything's perfectly level and perfectly flat and, you know you're you're doing 
Formula One stuff, but let's be honest, you know, most most people don't have access to that sort of yeah. Stuff. And so it's, it's, his his other comment on that was uh let's see, assuming a flat floor is a string method attached to the car or squared up to the car, but ground mounted is ground mounted preferred. He sees advantages to both. So string mounted to the car or having your strings mounted on the ground. Uh, I mean, if so, so the way I do it is I've got a, a car mount set up the smart strings, smart strings. It's kind of pricey, but by the time you, you piece all, I, I look at trying to build my own kit and piece it together. And it, it, made sense for me to get the smart string and it, it works great. Um, you know, you, you center everything off the front and rear hubs. So if, if you, whether you're using jack stands or however you come up to do it on the ground, as long as the strings are level to the car, I mean, you could hang it from the ceiling if you wanted to. Um, the, the car mount setups are, are pretty easy. And especially if you're only doing it for yourself, you can set your, your like the bar setup up holds the strings, you know? Um, yeah. You, you can just set it and forget it, you know? And so every time you put it back, it's, it's it goes right metal. back to the same place. Yeah, that's when I was running my Accord and World Challenge, that's what we had, the smart strings, and we had them configured the same way, put them right on the car. We'd do it in between sessions at the track. It'd take like 10 minutes. Yep. You know, it'd be like, yep. hit a big bump or whatever, check the alignment, good to go. Yep. Yeah, that's a good one. So alignment's a good question. So when you're, um, when you're thinking through, like, the Cayman behind you, carry – is a customer of ours. You did a seat uh, installation, some harnesses. He already had a harness bar. Um, now you're sorting out power steering because he had a power steering pump issue. You ordered some parts for that. But when you're thinking through, okay, he's going to the track on January 15th, pretty stock came in, fairly low grip, you know, 200 tread wear, a street tire. What other things are you going to look at on the car? What are you going to focus your energy on to ensure it's going to have a, you know, successful event outing? First, first thing and my favorite thing is brakes. If, uh, if your car doesn't stop, that's bad. Um, always, always change your fluid. It, you know, I mean, a lot of people complain about how expensive, you know, good racing fluid is. I use guys for less RF because I like it. Um, it's kind of pricey, but when you compare it, you know, apples to apples to other stuff, it's, it's not crazy. Um, always just bleed your fluid. It, it, you don't, you don't realize how hot your calipers get and how hot that fluid gets, even in a, you know, 15 minute, 20 minute HPD session. Um, just, just a quick, whether you have a pressure bleed or you have someone come help you out, hold the pedal for you, um, bleed the brakes, check the pads, uh, super easy stuff. Um, next biggest thing, nut and bolt check the amount of times <clears throat> you see people have issues, whether an HPD or, or, or a race or whatever, just because something came loose. Um, and, and that's super frustrating when it's, it's not that a part failed. It's not that you know, someone punted you off track and turned one or whatever. It's that you didn't spend the extra 15 minutes. And, and if you want to get crazy and take like a paint pen to, to mark your bolts, that's another step in the right direction. Just, and, and you'll learn on your car, especially if, if, if you're doing this for yourself, there's certain things that they just come loose. You know, we're these, these cars, any, any modern car is engineered so well, but we're not really doing with them what they're intended to do and you'll learn hey on my car for whatever reason the right rear outside control arm bolt it can always just take a little a little snug after after a track hit um but just and come up with you you know a routine a list and so every time before you go to the track throw the car up on jack stands crawl under it or if you have a lift make your life easier um and you've got it'll you know, hey, I need a 10 mil, a two 13s, uh, a 17 and a 19, you know, whatever wrenches. You grab your wrenches, your ratchet, and it takes 20 minutes. Uh, make sure everything's tight. It'll save you a boatload of frustration, uh, probably a lot of money if, you know, your wheel falls off the car. That's never fun. Um, and then and then just my one of my favorite sayings, and I know you've heard me say it before, a clean car is a happy car. Uh, <laughs> If, if you've got a car that's got oil leaks everywhere and it's dropping stuff and, and you never even bother to, to take a rag and just wipe everything down, you don't know if something's gone wrong. If your car is clean and then all of a sudden you see, you know, in the left front wheel well, everything's wet, then you can realize, oh, hey, I've got a, I've got a, a shock seal that's gone bad. My shock's blown out. If your car's nasty, you'd never know 
and you'd be running around going, man, I just can't get the lap time I used to be able to get. And it's a problem that you should have fairly easily spotted. Um, so first thing I do every time I, I get a car, car to the shop, um, wipe it down, wash it off. You know, again, it's, it's something that takes 20, 30 minutes and it makes it so every time you can spot if you've got an issue. Um, you know, there's, there's fluids in pretty much every aspect of these cars, shocks, brakes, engine, coolant, and everything. Um, yeah. You want to so know where you're losing fluid from. from you're losing it. Yeah, you want to be able to see those two drops before it turns into two gallons. Um, yeah, that's that's a pro tip, and it's a it's a uh, it's an extra step in the process. But like you and I both rode dirt bikes a little bit when we were growing up, and like, what's the first thing you do when you get back from your ride with your dirt bike? You know, you wash it. Off. Yeah. yeah, it's like the, yeah. the standard. It's like it's not a ride. You can't leave your bike dirty for a couple of days. That's just not even the thing in the dirt bike world. It, yeah. I mean, it, it is an extra step, but it's one of those things that you know a little bit now saves you a lot of heartache, headache in the longer you know yeah it's 20 minutes now so you don't have to replace an engine because it had an oil leak you didn't realize it had yeah it's just kind of stay on top of things yeah that's that's really important take the extra time while you're under the car doing your your checkup after the race or whatever to wipe everything down that that's dirty or that's you know keep everything nice and clean and you said make a to-do list that's really important to just like tactically how you approach your work in the shop have a to-do list for what you need to knock out what you do between events can you see the, you see the whiteboard behind yeah me? yeah yep. whiteboards paper pen and paper go. yep something to document it whether you do that with like a fancy app or something or an excel spreadsheet or a notebook notebooks probably the easiest for most of us because you're going to have dirty nasty hands afterwards so if you're relying on a on a spreadsheet, it's a little bit tougher sometimes, but particularly great like you were saying, sorry, go ahead. Uh, like spreadsheets, like you're talking about, it's great to have, you know, something saved in your computer or whatever, whether you're using it. I mean, th there's apps out there. You can make your own spreadsheet. Everyone do it. Um, but in the heat of the moment, it's a whole lot easier to have a pen and paper sitting on top of your toolbox at the track or, you know, on your trailer or in the back of your truck, whatever you do, um, that you can just, jot down whether it's tire pressure whether it's uh, alignment settings whether it's you know hey this session i felt this and the next session hey i felt this I, I, w just anything that you know kind of comes to mind just jot it down that's all you got to do and then you have those notes next time you come to the track and even if it's two years later you go wait a minute i remember feeling this before yeah, and you i've been here bump your notes and you go oh yeah that's what it was yeah, we, we did a webinar point. last year on the Apex Pro uh, page. We did a paid webinar on um, note taking and track map. We're doing actually doing another one on track maps coming up pretty soon, which is kind of similar to note taking because it's going to get down a lot of that kind of like how you feel after driving the car on track or, you know, what, what felt different about the car. But even little stuff when it comes to car prep, like, uh, you know, if you have your same notebook that you use that has like the little square diagram for tire pressures and maybe tire temps and then shock settings, wing angle, whatever you want to put in there, it doesn't really matter. Three or four different things that you track. You can always put a note above it too. put the date and put, you know, during nut and bolt check subframe bolt loose, you know, like note something that'll... like that. And then you'll find patterns. You'll be like every three track events, the subframe bolts back out. And it makes your life so easy. Maintenance schedule. Yeah. It's key. So yep. you, you know, just like you're saying, hey, every every three rounds, I found that suffering bolts were loose. So I need to make sure every other round at minimum to tighten them. And then you never get there. Yeah. And there, there's a lot it's, of stuff to... It's easier said than done. Like, in, especially if you're at the track by yourself, taking notes and, and documenting all this stuff. I, it's easier said than done. I, I get caught up plenty of times. I mean, you know, this Andrew will be, you know, session back to back sessions, and then you go into qualifying, and all of a sudden, at the end of the day, and you go, "Wait, what did we do?" And you don't remember what changes you made. And, and yeah. I'm guilty of it, just as anyone else is. But I can I can tell you guys to do it, even though I I don't always right. do it myself. Well, I, I'm, I mean, I'm a driver coach. That's the epitome of that, right? I'm going to give the advice to you guys that's ideal and that you should do every time, but I struggle to do it a lot of times myself. It's just part of uh, human accountability and 
all that sort of stuff. So I think what, what you're kind of drilling down into is we're starting this, this, this shop business that's going to be built to support particularly the track community here in Birmingham, Alabama, near Barber Motorsports Park, but really anybody that wants to work with somebody that's got extremely high quality experience and a background that's going to be really, really hard to find. But a lot of these things that you're going to be doing, and a lot of probably what you do at the museum is not necessarily a difficult, challenging job. What's difficult and challenging about it is the documentation, the the just taking the time to actually do it. Because most of us, driving's our hobby, and we're prepping our car too. A lot of people watching this, you're probably like, Dad, you know, I've got garage like Mitch has behind me. I got the car up on jack stands. Sometimes I just run out of time to do it. Finding a shop that's an ally, that's a resource. It's kind of what I, what this this um, kind of partnership and business will look like in the future. So it's it's finding that guy that you can trust who, when you get halfway through a project, you have somebody that can help you to the end because we always bite off a little more that we can chew. And that's what um, what this this business will be like. So for quite a while, I've had Apex Pro customers asking me and you know left and right, where do I take my car to get it worked on? You know, near you guys in Birmingham, and there hasn't really been a great answer for that. And this is kind of going to solve uh, that problem here locally. So it's, it's really exciting. Ryan says Scotty's in Facebook jail and says he loves you both. And Mitch Cobb is killing it. So Scotty's very complimentary. Thank you, Scotty. That's, that's good. I was, I was trying to figure out if, so I'm, I'm good at working on cars. I'm not good at Facebook because, well, now I did it. I've been trying to like that comment for a while. But I can't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's okay. We got the technical side. I'll, we'll handle that. Not a big I'll handle that. Just keep working on cars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and still kind of talking about shop being your ally for just making sure you stay on top of things. One of the biggest things that we've been working on with uh, John's E46 WRL program is, and I, I just kind of hit on this earlier, but maintenance schedules. You know, in, in a lot of these races, as competitive as they are, as quick as the cars are, as good as, as the drivers are, the guys that win are the ones that don't have any issues, whether it's, you know, a, a you know, have to have to stay on pit road for five minutes because, you know, the, the sway bar end link came loose or you got to take it behind the wall for an hour because, you know, you got to change the wheel bearing, whatever it may be. One of the biggest things that we really try to focus on is as soon as you have a mechanical issue or failure, you're done. So what can we do to really stay on top of that? Um, and, and, you know, speed is great. Having a car that can, you know, pull 1.9 G's in the corner instead of the other guys that are doing 1.7, that's great. But at the end of the day, if your stuff breaks, you're, 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 it's, it's all for, it's all for nothing. Yep. That's, that's the difference in championships usually is reliability. Yep. Um, and you saw that, you know, back in, you said 2007, Kimi Raikkonen and in 2000, not 2007, 2006, or whenever he was with McLaren, they had the fastest car in Formula One, but they kept breaking. Yeah, and they never went. They never won the championship with him in that car because of it. And everybody knows who we're talking about: folks that are that do Grid Life, Time Attack, and GLTC. You know, you're thinking of the folks who have some unreliable cars or who need, kind of need to hear that message because it's reliability is not always super intuitive. It's kind of doing the boring parts of the process that make the car reliable. So it's like documenting when you have a failure you know, doing some research to understand what might, you know, if you're going to stick your tires, what added stress is that putting on the car's different components and trying to predict some of that stuff. But mostly it's just recording like, hey, we changed wheel bearings a year ago. Well, this car's done four WRL races, World Racing League, you know, 16 hours a weekend, 20 hours a weekend with a test day, probably should go ahead and change them, right? Things like that are really important. And, and a lot of times, it, the way I look at it, the way I justify doing you know, preventative maintenance, um, you know, yeah. Okay. So a set of wheel bearings for your car, 800 bucks. Well, how much does your whole track weekend cost? Especially if you're, you're going out of town for, you know, an endurance race where you've got 200 gallons of fuel, you've got two sets of tires, you've gotten three hotel rooms for four nights, you know, that, that $800 that you, you tried to put off on your wheel bearings might have just ruined that whole weekend. And it's, it's kind of one of those, one of those catch 22 things a lot of times, but, you know, just always, always try to stay on top of that kind of stuff. Yeah. Thanks for some good questions, guys. We'll, uh, 
I actually want to go back to something that I saw that Jim, uh, Jim Smith Lane said he was going to put some G log pads on his, uh, on his fit. So Jim, I'm not sure if you're a lifetime or plus annual subscriber or not, but for those of you who are, if you have an apex pro and you subscribe to our premium yearly membership, it's a hundred bucks today. We just announced a discount in association with G lock. So Danny Puskar from G lock pads is offering 10% off G lock pads, 15% off. If that order is over $400, and that's not one time, that is for your entire Apex Pro annual subscription. So if your subscription starts on January 1st, you can buy discounted brake pads through that subscription renewal period a year from now. Um, so that's really cool. We use G-Locks on the E36 at NCM, and both of us seem to be really happy with the um, with the product. So that, I think they're really awesome. It's, they have much better modulation than most pads. As in, like, when you release your foot off the brake pedal, you can really feel there's like a lot of dexterity with how you control the rate of release and the, the rate that the pads come off the rotors and some pads that have a, maybe a like really aggressive bite don't necessarily have that same control. Um, yeah. You, you don't want an on off brake pad. You don't want an on off throttle. You don't want an on off brake pad. Um, and, and a lot of people don't, you know, they haven't, they haven't experienced that yet to where they go from, you know, they just, they just put on the most aggressive track compound pad that, that they can find for their application and don't really play with with different compounds and then you go to a less aggressive compound or or a compound that that has the same ultimate friction but has better modulation and all of a sudden it's it's a whole new world for you 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 realize that oh yeah. i i can break this late and still you know make the corner or not over slow the corner or you know whatever whatever you might be struggling with but brake pads can make a huge difference yeah if, if you're unhappy with the brake pads you're using or if you are happy and you just want to try something else or maybe you're already using g-locks i'm not particularly like brand loyal and i, I want to say that because i really appreciate danny's support there's lots of really good brake pads out there but i do really like what g-lock offers and uh, if you want a pad that's got a good modulation i'd highly recommend giving theirs a shout um, you don't have to have an apex pro to get that discount all you have to do is download our app create an account and purchase the hundred dollar a year subscription because you only need a couple of sets of brake pads with a 10% discount to get the, that hundred dollars back. And then, you know, if you're going to buy five sets, six sets of brake pads next year, you're going to be uh, in the green pretty quickly with that deal. So just wanted to get that out there. Cause it's really cool. You'll see emails. If you're already subscribing, you'll get an email with how to redeem that offer. We'll be talking about it and promoting it more through the end of the year. Um, so if you're considering the annual subscription, um, there's just more stuff coming. We're probably going to have some more safety gear deals through our partnership network. That's going to be awesome. Um, Mitch Ryan is asking, uh, are you guys going to offer any trackside services? And uh, Doug Francis just joined. Hey, Doug. Uh, trackside services. Um, so currently what what our, our goal is, is to be able to offer um, – you'll, you'll be able to put this a lot better than I will, Andrew – uh, kind of our, our focus, at least for the time being, is going to be uh, a lot of WRL races. We're going to as many grid life races as possible. And then we'll be doing, you know, local uh, HBD stuff, um, supporting people's, people's race efforts, uh, that sort of stuff. Um, there, there is companies that go to track days or races or whatever, just kind of as a uh, mobile track side shop, if you will, um, if you know what I'm talking about, where they're just there and ready and available. That's not currently part of our plan. Um, we're, we're already pretty well busy with, uh, you know, a couple different race schedules this year. Um, but, but our goal is to, you know, you, we, we team up with, with you guys, the car owners, and whether we do the prep or not, hopefully we do, um to make our our job that weekend that much easier um but then we'll we'll go to the track solely with you as our client and just help you kind of enjoy your weekend have the best weekend possible um go fast not have any issues and instead of you you know busting your butt in between sessions to check tire pressures and tire temps and and service your brakes and make changes and blah 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 you get to uh kind of enjoy yourself a little more and, and we handled our part 
Yeah, absolutely. So Ryan, to answer your question, trackside service is already kind of part of the model, but it's it's for clients that were um, building and, and developing and um, preparing cars for. So it's more of, we're more focused on, and Mitch is more focused on the individual, you know, the people that we work with, knowing our clients really, really well, knowing the people that we work with really well, understanding their needs and tailoring kind of these maintenance programs that Mitch talked about, recommendations for service, car prep, and then trackside support. But as a business model, when you look at a shop model, you make your, your money by billing hours during the work week. You know, if you can bill 40 hours a week, that's an ideal way to operate your shop business. Um, and that's a lot more profitable than, than pricing things to be profitable track side, because to be honest, like a lot of people we want to work with couldn't afford how expensive a purely track side focused business model would be. You know, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars a weekend. If the that's hours your primary income work out as well, but it's, it's, it's still something. I mean, we're, we're still going to be there. It's just, cause that's, that's what we want to do. We want to be at the racetrack. Um, yeah. You know, we're, we're, we're working the, the hours during the week at the shop to, facilitate everyone being in the track so yeah and ryan says extra mile service idea ryan we I'll have to bring you on as like a consultant or something because he's going yeah, down all the right roads you got uh, review data recommend car tweaks service those changes and boom happy faster customer sounds sounds like last weekend huh yeah have you been listening to to our phone calls ryan or something yeah yeah we yes. also we want to race we want to race last sunday now that we're thinking about yeah we won the champ car race but um ryan yeah that's and and that Comment is exactly why Mitch and I've been working together for over a year now to, to put this, um, this action plan in place because I've had ownership in this storage building for a while and we want to service more people and help more people develop good track cars. And because of Apex Pro, we have, I have a strong relationship and the company has a, a good, strong relationship and credibility with people who need these types of services. And I want to be able to help people more than just look at their data and make a recommendation and maybe have a coaching client in the future. I want to be able to help ensure that you have a good experience. I want people whose first introduction into motorsports is the apex pro app and they download it to time some free laps. I want them to eventually see Mitch and us as a resource for help with their car and other things, um, which is a reminder, if you're not already aware, apex pro is um, you can download the app for free and time your laps using the app. And that's something that we're going to be focusing a lot more on for, you know, welcoming more people into the Apex Pro family that don't have the hardware yet, but want just lap times from their Apex Pro device or from their, from the Apex Pro app. You can actually just use like your phone, download the app, use your phone and get lap times um, using the Apex Pro lap, uh, app for free. Um, Mitch, did we, did we, is there anything worth covering? I know we didn't go into uh, your, um, your Grand Am experience, but you did a couple of events in the, uh, in the Grand Am series back in the days of the Continental Tire, Coney, Coney uh, Sports no, Car Challenge. Coney, Coney Challenge, this is before, before yeah. Coney. Uh, yeah, I got to, um, uh, got hooked up with so, some good friends of ours that had been from Colorado that had been racers, you know, lifelong racers. Um, some friends of theirs were running a Grand Am program and got to do, go do a couple races with them and like oh it was 2005 because I think it was the same year that uh, the Team 16 at 24 and the, and the prototype Daytona prototype car I was there in the uh, Continental Challenge race and I was like well, these guys are 16 but I'm 15 so that was pretty cool. <laughs> Um, and, and lo and behold, he's a guy that we've been racing with against in WRL lately. So, so it's kind of cool seeing, seeing these guys that used to be Grand Am racers kind of realizing how, what, uh, what WRL is offering right now. Um, so that's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, WRL's, WRL's gotten really competitive the past couple of years for amateur endurance racing and it's a lot all of really professional level guys. Are amateur are, yeah. It's hard yeah. to call them amateur. Yeah. Yeah, it is kind of funny because it is, especially in the top class in GTO, it's very, very highly professional. You know, you're looking at professionally prepared cars, you know, um, very, very professionally built. Um, similar competition level, it's endurance racing, so it's a little different competition, but similar to what we see in Grid Life Touring Cup. Um, as far as if you're comfortable in GLTC, then WRL is the perfect slot in for endurance competition. Um Guys, let us know if you have any more questions. We'll be on signing off here in a couple of minutes, but um, Mitch Cobb is your resource for 
any track prep, car related questions, how to make your car go faster on the track, modifications, how do I go win races, how do I build it for a class. If you guys want to seek Mitch's advice and Mitch, let's, uh, if you can comment in the comments there so people can reach out to you on Facebook, because I think that's probably the best way to get a hold of you. Okay. Um, so if anybody has questions for Mitch, anything you want to follow up with specific questions, maybe some consulting or advice on your, uh, your off season projects, maybe you're geographically located near us in Birmingham and want to talk about some future work. Um, <laughs> reach out to Mitch. He just commented and said, it's me, send him a friend request and, uh, and ping him and get something in the works because um, we've got a Cayman we're working on. We've got several, a couple of E46s, E36s. Might be working on a C5 Corvette. There's just all sorts of cool stuff happening. So it'll be a, a fun event. We need, to, we, need to get, we need to get him him locked down. Yeah. Get, get him I'm, a, up. I'm an LS guy at heart. Hard, hard to be in a good LS power plant, so. That's a good one. <laughs> yep. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, and you'll see Mitch back at the track. Uh, again, we'll probably be doing some stuff together in WRL, hopefully grid life promoting apex pro Mitch will be prepping the cars. Um, you guys will be able to, uh, to meet him at those events. Yep. Anything you want to include? What? Anything you want to talk about before we sign off? Shoot. I think we've, we've, we've kind of done a, you know, Quick and quick and dirty hour. We're we're at almost an hour, aren't we? Almost an hour. Yeah. If it, you know, and the other thing too is if you happen to have like a John Surtees Formula One car sitting in your garage, and you know you need some yeah, advice. I know, yeah. I, I know a guy who who knows knows a little bit about those. So yeah, pre-war uh, BMW motorcycles. Yeah. Have one of those. Let me know. Yeah. Pretty wild. I think it's a pretty wild. I think the only other one of those in existence, the one that I have eight, eight cylinder is owned by uh, Bernie Ecclestone. So really? if, you, if Bernie, if you happen to be watching, you know how to find me now. It's in yeah. the comments. He's a regular <laughs> watcher. You know, we, we get a lot of feedback that there's lots of billionaires that watch this Facebook live broadcast. I, I don't understand. Yeah. All right, guys, thanks for tuning in. Hopefully you learned something. I have a feeling that Mitch will probably be back talking more about some specific experiences in the future and some car prep. We'll see some of you at Barber on uh, January 15th and 16th. Can't wait. We've got a lot of friends coming down from the Great White North to get some uh, some winter track time down here. Apex Pro Lap Timer Plus subscribers, annual members, 10%, 15% off G-Log pads, 10% on any order of G-Log pads, 15% off an order of $400 or more. Just got to have the $100 annual membership. Hit us up if you have any questions about that. Shoot the Apex Pro page a message. Thanks for being here, guys. Thanks for joining us, Mitch. This is fun. Yeah, enjoyed it. Thanks, uh, thanks for all the cool questions, guys. Good chatting with you. Uh, let us let us know how we can help. Yeah, see you at the track. See you guys.